Welcome back to the Chess Geek channel. Today we are going to be discussing the English defense, which is basically the combination of e6 and b6. These two pawn moves, regardless of what white plays. So for example, d4, here you can play e6 or b6, and you get this sort of setup. And white takes full control of the center with pawns. In the meantime, we are going to fianchetto our bishops and develop our knights and try to strike in the center with the variety of pawn breakthroughs we have, being d5, c5, and even f5. Now, I've previously made several videos on this particular opening from black side. So if you want to learn the theory of this opening, those are the videos you should check out. What we are doing today is we're going to see how that theory applies in real game examples. I have found two games where the black side demonstrates beautifully the ideas, the concepts, the important motifs of this opening. And so we're going to explore those two games. And if you have the knowledge, the theory that we've previously covered, this will really complete your understanding of this opening. So let's jump in straight to the first example. And this one is by Hikaru Nakamura with the black pieces playing against Michael William Brown. This was uh, from the Pro League Stage Rapid in 2019, very recent game. Let's see how Hikaru played this. So, uh, the game began with d4, e6, we saw c4, b6, and now a3. a3 is something you are very often going to see, trying to play a bit prophylactic. As you know, the bishop coming to b4 is a very important piece and, and uh, part of this opening. And you'll see that sometimes your opponent tries to restrict that from happening by playing a3 because the bishop here will pin the knight, making the center more vulnerable for white. And again, these ideas we see in the theory-based videos that I've already created. So Hikaru obviously doesn't play bishop before. And what you'll see is he ends up placing the bishop on d6. And here, white has not only restricted the bishop from coming to b4, but also expanded uh, greatly with d5. And very often, the most precise way to play against the English defense is to expand quickly. If you go for the more normal, let's say, more appealing option of just grabbing full control in the center, these pawns are not sustainable. They're going to fall one by one. And so very often, uh, white, if they're playing precisely, will expand on one pawn uh, and also try to restrict the pawn breakthroughs that we often have. That's not an issue, though, and very often if you can't get in these pawn breakthroughs, you just develop in a much more positional way. Instead of fighting for the center control with pawns, you're going to maneuver your pieces, uh, taking control of the important squares in the position, and that is what you should notice here. And so we have castles, e4, rook to e8, we have takes, takes, and we have a5, taking more control on the queen side, again, because white is trying to restrict the center breakthroughs. We have h6, stopping the bishop from coming to the most active g5 square, knight to b5, the bishop hops back, and here we have d6. And this is what I mean. As you see here, it becomes abundantly clear that dark squares are where black is most strong. And this is what Hikaru uses to his advantage. He maneuvers his pieces using the dark squares. So we see knight b to d7, now knight e5, taking control of a very active centralized square. Rook to e1, we have knight to d7, knight d4, and now knight c5, taking control of the other square. And so it's not always important, as I emphasized uh, in the theory-based chapters, to get in these breakthroughs, that's not the only way to play these sort of positions. You can play with a little less space and a bit more positional mindset, and that is certainly what Hikaru is doing here. You can see grabbing even more critical squares, tying down this knight, otherwise you lose material. Uh, so just slowly but surely positionally squeezing the opponent. It's truly a beautiful display here. We have bishop a6, and this is something uh, to point out as well. The only downside of this sort of position, uh, as it may seem, are the bishops. Usually the bishops get very active, get very powerful. Here they seem a little bit not so active, not so powerful, but 
that is subject to change, and Hikaru again illustrates how to do so. This bishop, as a little spoiler, takes home on this beautiful diagonal, and this bishop will also find home on this diagonal. So, unless it is some extreme situation when the position is super closed, which is super unlikely because there's a lot of pawns in the center, often one of them will trade irrespective of the uh, game plan that both players are illustrating. So, very often you're going to have ways to creatively bring your pieces into the game. And that is what is shown here. So we have bishop to b7 kicking away the knight. And you can see here the knight hops into a better square. The bishop hops into a better square. So already the bishop is clearly uh, very powerful on this long diagonal. And now bishop a6. This other bishop is also trying to get powerful. Suddenly there's some potential ideas like b5 floating in the air. There's some pressure, as you will see, on this pawn. And the bishop, um, as it turns out, is a very powerful piece over here. And uh, you see this very quickly after knight takes, king takes, the king is now aligned with this bishop, uh, and therefore after queen f5, the knight is hit, the knight moves, there's queen takes d5 using that fact. Um, and now the position just slowly starts to crumble for white, and Ikaru keeps up the pressure, using the pin even further by pushing the pawn, and now a very beautiful tactical idea sacrificing the bishop to win back the knight with interest. And now these pawns are, of course, super strong. Uh, these pawns are very weak as well. And there's a million ways to go about converting this position, even though it's not the, the easiest position to convert. And you do have to pay attention to white's ideas of counterplay because the knight is so not active, because the king is so um, in danger compared to this king. It's difficult to really create any sort of uh, counterplay here. And that is what Black, unfortunately, realizes when they resign in this position. The, the pawn on h3 is falling. There's no counterplay whatsoever. Every pawn is defended, in fact, and uh, it's time to resign. So beautiful display, a very positional uh, display, using the, the knights in this really um, thematic way of positionally moving them using the dark squares. Moving on to game number two, we have Boris Gelfand with the white pieces playing against Grishuk. And again, we have the e6, b6 English opening. We have a bit of a more traditional way uh, for white to play this, just grabbing full control. And you'll see these pawns are rather vulnerable. So we have bishop d3 and a very early f5. This is something I mentioned uh, again, in the previous videos, you want to expose this weak diagonal when they take out their bishop. Specifically, this pawn and rook are in deep danger. And here, white took. I should mention, this is a blitz game. Uh, doesn't make it less instructive because they still illustrate some really common thematic ideas, but it is a blitz game. And so black perhaps wasn't so comfortable taking here. Maybe they weren't so uh, brushed up on the theory of this and they were scared of queen to h5, which is understandable, but I talk about this quite a bit uh, in the previous videos I made. This is not an issue whatsoever. You simply play g6 here, and after takes, you play bishop g7. You have to be very precise, but if you are, then there's no issue. The point is you want to bring this square for the king so the king doesn't have to step closer towards the center and allow for some nasty checks. And therefore, after this, we simply move they promote, we simply take. And as it turns out, we've managed to activate all of our pieces, admittedly in a very unorthodox way, but our king is, for the most part, safe enough here. And yeah, our rook is active, our bishops are active, this rook is inevitably falling, and we have no real issues here. So white should have um, been scared to take here, and black should have punished them by taking, and hopefully you will do that in your games. But uh, instead, black decided to play bishop b4 check and then knight to f6. So not a very precise way to play, but you'll see even in this sort of method uh, of playing, black got great play. Now, the thing to point out here is sometimes this check does force the king to move, especially if there is also pressure here. And when they take, uh, and in general, if you play the f5 lines, you'll notice this f file becomes open and you want to identify where your strengths are. So if you play c5, d5 combinations, then you want most likely your rooks to go onto the C and D file. If you're playing more on the king side with F5, 
then you want your rooks to stack on the f file. And so basically in this position, the f file is clearly um, the most powerful file you want to take control of. And what black ends up doing is doing just that, taking full control of the f file, not worrying so much on the queen side as we saw in the previous game, but rather on the king side, noticing the critical files, the critical areas of the board. And eventually, uh, black goes ahead and takes control of these files. Uh, and you see this after queen f7, pawn takes, queen takes, black has stacked over here. There's all sorts of expanding ideas uh, with the e-pawn, which is exactly what happens. Now the knight has to move and the pawn hangs, and now the rook uh, is forced to a, a much more passive state as well, and the knight maneuvers in. All of the pieces are surrounding and huddling into the position. The threat of mate is, of course, dangerous, so the knight is taken off the board, but that was a very strong knight for white, and now it's just a matter of time. The end, the position transforms into an endgame, which is clearly better for black, decisively better. It's, it's just simply winning. Black decides to trade. You still have to be careful. I mean, rook endgames are notorious for being drawn. Here, it's not drawn, but you still should be careful uh, and play with an abundance of caution. But because of the, the fact that this pawn is weak and will inevitably fall, and then these two pawns are protected past connected pawns, that's a mouthful. It's just game over. So you see this here. The pawn tries to run for white, but very quickly... Um, it becomes clear to both players that these pawns are going to be unstoppable, and here, in fact, just white resigned. So again, you don't have to play necessarily uh, when you play b6 and e6. You're not committing to play on the king side, not on the queen side either. You're playing in a very flexible manner. You're ready to strike on the queen side, as we saw in the Hikaru Nakamura game. You're ready to strike on the king side, as we see here. You're ready to play more positional sort of maneuvering games, getting your pieces involved, as we saw in the first game, you're ready to play a much more tactical, sharp, aggressive game, as we saw here. So super flexible setup. You're going to get so many cool, creative, uh, instructive positions. It truly will make you a better chess player. And it's super solid um, and a great way to defeat your opponents. So the English defense, definitely consider playing. It seems passive, but truly is not because of the a, all of the variety of options you have to break through the center. So definitely consider playing it. And if you want to get a head start on the theory, then check out those two videos I made about this opening. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe if you're new around here. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Check out my chess website where you can learn about all different projects that I'm making, all my masterclasses and things of this nature. And I will see you all next time. Peace out.